You're listening to the Huddle Up! Podcast with Chad Jensen and Zach Kelberman. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com and sound off. And now it's time to drop some knowledge. Welcome in, everybody, to another episode of the Huddle Up! Podcast presented, as always, by Mile High Huddle and 24-7 Sports. I am your host, Chad Jensen. With me, as always, is your Denver Broncos reporter for 24-7 Sports. He is Zach Kelberman. Zach, we told the listeners after Saturday night's loss to the Cleveland Browns that we might just maybe get back to him for an impromptu additional episode between that game and Monday Night Football on Christmas Eve. And it turns out that a little story broke during the week that gave us just the opportunity and ammunition to do just that. Yeah, a little story came out of absolutely nowhere that Mike Shanahan, the legendary Broncos coach, uh, was in talks with John Elway to return last year, and he would come in place of Vance Joseph. It totally floored me. It was a great scoop by uh, Woody Page to get that story, Mm -hmm. and it it blew me away that I I didn't even think they would even explore that. And if that story is to be believed, then it, it really gleans some insight into how Elway works and how that front office works with Joe Ellis. Yes. And for those of you, I mean, I I would assume most of you listening to this podcast have taken the time to go read that piece. If you haven't, stop right now. Go find it. It was published on the Colorado uh, Gazette, excuse me, Colorado Springs Gazette by Woody Page. And he, it was heavily vetted, all of his source information, five different sources were cited in the written article. And it's pretty much bulletproof. And then even after the fact, Mike Kliss came out with a kind of compendium piece to go along with it, shot down. It was a little bit shooting down a couple of the aspects of Woody Page's piece. And then, of course, everybody in Denver media came out after the fact and said, yeah, we've all kind of known this all this last year. We just haven't said anything, which right. you can believe about half of half of them. Some of them, sure. Most of them, no. But regardless, the main gist of it is that Mike Shanahan last year, you know, he hasn't coached in the NFL since 2013. And the Denver Broncos, we know for with John Elway, this whole idea of – He's drawn to the idea of getting the band back together. We saw that. It's what makes him comfortable. It's what makes him confident. We know that that was his wish list to to get Gary Kubiak, for example, when he first came to Denver in 2011 as VP of Football Operations. But he couldn't hire Kubiak because he was currently employed by the Houston Texans. And as soon as basically Kubiak was fired, he couldn't he couldn't immediately fire John Fox because things were going pretty good for the Denver Broncos at that point. But once the stars aligned in order for Elway to feasibly get Kubiak under lock and key, he lubed it up, made sure he could lock him down and get him in Denver. And he really tried to convince Gary Kubiak and even change the way the Broncos were doing things and try and lighten the load for Kubiak to stay and not resign at the end of the 2016 uh, 2016 season. Couldn't do it. And of course, Kubiak steps down and we get Vance Joseph. But it tells you, Zach, how much John Elway really is drawn to the idea of getting the band back together. And with Mike Shanahan, there was some back history there as far as, you know, John Elway and Shanahan's relationship reportedly had been strained a little bit post his playing career, Elway's playing career. But those have apparently been mended, whatever issues they may have had. The only thing that held this back from happening, Zach, was Joe Ellis, who, and that is, of course, Denver's team president, who apparently still has a little bit of an axe to grind as it relates to one Mike Shanahan because he pumped the brakes. He said, you know what, John? John first of all, John took the story to him, or the, the deal to him, the opportunity. He said, look, Mike Shanahan, apparently from reports, he already had a, a deal worked up with Shanahan. Not just like, hey, here's an idea I have, Joe. What do you think? Like, he'd already talked to Mike Shanahan, had the framework of a deal in place to bring him back as head coach. Oh, and by the way, we can get Kirk Cousins on a team discount so long as as Mike Shanahan is the head coach. Joe Ellis says, John, give me an hour or two to consider it. Comes back, and he says, not only does he shoot it down, but he says, your options are thus. You either stick it out with Vance Joseph, or you fire Vance Joseph, and you do a comprehensive head coaching search. And at first, this was a, a, a point that was missed, Zach. He didn't, from what I understand after the fact, Ellis didn't tell necessarily Elway outright no on Shanahan. But what he did say is, you can't just fire Joseph and immediately hire Shanahan. If if 
If that's what you want to do, first, what you have to do is make sure he's the best candidate. You have to do a comprehensive coaching search, which apparently Elway wasn't really prepared to do. Yeah, the big takeaway was that Ellis wanted a quote-unquote real coaching search instead of just firing one guy and immediately hiring his replacement. But the story really shed some light on a few topics for me. It showed that Elway is not number one in charge in that front office. Joe Ellis has a lot of power that a lot of people don't realize. People think he's just uh, he's out of the day-to-day aspect of running the Broncos and he defers to Elway. No, he's still Elway's boss, and Elway— If that report, like I said, is to be believed, he definitely answers to him. Uh, Secondly, it showed me that Elway is going to go toward a veteran head coach with his next hire. It it shows me that he wants a guy who's been established, who's been around, who's won in in this business. And hiring Vance Joseph, a guy who had one year as a coordinator, he doesn't want to take that chance once again. And that, to me, is the right move. Also, if that Cousins part is true, uh, maybe Keenum wasn't his first choice. There was a report that came out that said they never even made Cousins an offer. Uh, Would that have changed if Shanahan was here? I mean, it it all – there's so many different aspects to this. And um, I just think that there's – it starts at the top. And with the ownership issues and now the GM and the team president butting heads, this is not um, a stable organization right now. I mean, that report – and what I found interesting was the Broncos – you know, Vance Joseph, he didn't even deny it. Even Woody Page was expecting him, them to deny it. He confirmed that he talked to John Elway about it. So there's some truth to that, and it just kind of changed my opinion and my viewpoint of the Broncos front office and how they want to handle this coaching search. Right. And that's the thing is, you know, John Elway was later promoted to be president of football operations, so it makes me wonder at what point, you know, where the power dynamic lies between Elway and Ellis because— right. One's team president that's supposed to kind of be over business operations and one's over the actual product on the field, the football operations. This time last year, Elway was a vice president while Joe Ellis was the president. Now they're both presidents technically of the team, although I would assume that uh, Ellis's role takes precedent over, in a senior sense, over Elway. And even on top of that, he's one of Ellis three members of the Pat Bowlen Trust. So he pretty Mm. much has ironclad control over everything Denver Broncos moving forward. So yeah, you know, Broncos fans over the last, well, whatever, it's been six, seven years since Elway came back to the front office, we've kind of all thought, you know, he's, he's the guy that has the final say on this and that. Well, we're finding out, to your point, Zach, that Joe Ellis is actually the guy that has the final say. So John Elway... Mm -hmm. You know, he might cook up an idea to do this or to do that. Most of them, he probably doesn't have to run by Ellis. But certain things like hiring any coach and especially going back in time to kind of try and rekindle the old magic, hire a guy like Mike Shanahan. Because it's not just that he's a former head coach. It's not just that he's the all-time winningest head coach in Denver Broncos history. I mean, the dude has won a lot of games. It's the fact that Shanahan and Ellis have some real history together some right. budding of the head so when shanahan was finally fired in 20 or 2008 after 14 years of of coaching the denver broncos ellis was reportedly the the, the main guy pushing that trying to convince pat bolin because up to this point pat bolin and mike shanahan had become dear friends they were more like partners and best buddies than they were employer and employee and so it was very hard for Bolin had to really be persuaded that this was the right decision at the time to fire Mike Shanahan, who was coming off of, you know, this would have been three consecutive, it was three consecutive years of missing the playoffs, 06, 07, 08. At the end of 08, the Broncos start that season 8-5, and Jay Cutler's lighting it up, you know, he has a Pro Bowl season, and the Broncos just completely lose all the air, goes out of the balloon the final three games, they lose them all, and miss the playoffs, and that was kind of the final straw for Joe Ellis to be able to kind of, as a selling point, go to to Pat Bowen and say, look, the time has come. Like, he's worn out his welcome. And from the things that I've heard after the fact, and it's not just recently, but just over the years, was that Joe Ellis was of the opinion that Mike Shanahan, who had a lot of power in a football sense, you know, he was over personnel. <clears throat> you know, he had different GMs during that time, but he was the main guy making the final decision on personnel. He was the head coach that he felt like, Shanahan had kind of taken uh, measures beyond his station, that he was going above and beyond his brief 
which apparently felt like a shot across Ellis's bow in a threatening way somehow, because he's the one that basically put it all together to convince Bolin to fire him. So now you're going back on all of these this water under the bridge. It's a lot to overcome if you're John Elway. Notwithstanding, you know, you could go to Joe Ellis and say, hey, look, man, it worked with Kubiak. You know, I know the model. Shanahan's ready to go. And what's even more surprising to me, Zach, actually, is that Shanahan wanted to come back, too, to the Denver Broncos. Right. I mean, mean, he's got a legacy to protect as a Denver Broncos all-time winning as head coach. And also the fact he wasn't holding any gripes over them passing up Kyle Shanahan for the job either. And there's a a connection to be made there. If Ellis didn't want Mike Shanahan, maybe that played a part of Elway hiring Vance Joseph over Shanahan. So um, to your point, though, about breaking up the band or getting it back together, he let Wade Phillips walk out the door pretty easily. So if he wanted the band to stay together, uh, he should have tried a little harder than that. Maybe he had some buyer's remorse. Um, after bringing in Vance Joseph and he saw that he wasn't the right coach for the team. But regardless, he still had a chance to get rid of him last year. I mean, even if he didn't hire Mike Shanahan again, he could have gotten rid of Vance Joseph. So it showed that he's not too committed to him, and he was never too committed to him, again, if that story is to be believed. Right. Uh, but by far, to me, the biggest takeaway of all the different things, all the different storylines and the narratives in that one article is the fact that Ellis, and not Elway, is the man in that front office. That's right. Absolutely. He has the final say. And while it shouldn't be that big of a surprise because he's the guy at the top of the business side of the Denver Broncos, in other words, he's the guy holding the purse and the purse strings. From a budget, from a money perspective, always got to run certain things by him. Anyone who kind of understands just any, even the basic rudiments of business understands there's someone at the top that has to okay certain things. But this is one of those deals where it's going to, it's really blown back on Ellis because even yeah. though he is, you know, he he didn't just outright deny, no, Mike Shanahan, no. He told John Elway, look, if you do a comprehensive search and Mike Shanahan turns out to be the best option, then we can talk about it type thing. But, like, it's either that or stick with Vance Joseph. And Elway wasn't prepared to go through a comprehensive coaching search. I mean, that's a thing. But still, Broncos country is perceiving this as Joe Ellis basically is the reason why we got year two of the Vance Joseph regime. Right. And so and there and there is some truth to it, obviously, but I don't think it's necessarily 100 percent fair because after the fact, one of the things that hasn't been that well reported is that it wasn't that he just said, no, Zach, he said, you got to go through a comprehensive search. And then if he is the best guy, then, you know, we'll talk about it type thing. But Elway never has really been the guy who wants to do the comprehensive search. He's got his guy. He goes for him. He gets him. That's done. Like if you go back to 2011, he Went for John Fox right away. That's who he knew he wanted. He he hired him. That was that. Uh, With Gary Kubiak, the same. With Vance Joseph, the same. Like the the Kyle Shanahan interview, the Dave Tobe interview two years ago. I mean, those were all perfunctory. Elway wanted Vance Joseph from the time when Joseph was supposed to interview under Gary Kubiak as defensive coordinator and the Bengals blocked him. That's what sold Elway on, I think Vance Joseph is our guy for this to succeed Gary Kubiak as head coach. He's never really done that comprehensive head coaching search, Zach, which I think is interesting. And even those of you out there listening who go, you know what, I really like the idea of Mike Shanahan, the mastermind, quote unquote, coming back to Denver. I think you would have to hope that John Elway at this point, with three consecutive seasons of missing the playoffs, would have the football sense to say, look, here's what I'm thinking, but i got to exhaust every option and opportunity out there on the coaching market to ensure I'm right and maybe going through that process uncover a superior option that can really make the difference for the franchise. Yeah, Elway is very impulsive, and that's why fans don't understand that he's not going to fire Vance when he, when they want him to. He's not going to respond to fan pushback and blowback. I mean, he does things how he wants, but there's no question with that report. It painted Ellis in an extremely unfavorable light, and it painted Elway in an extremely favorable light. And it leads me to wonder if those sources leaked out of Elway's circle we go. or yep. impact and, and maybe even Elway himself. I mean, it, it just – it kind of aligns with that, that the timing of it, the the verbiage of the story, the tone of it, the narrative, it, it leads me to believe that Elway kind of pushed that out there. So if he wanted to look like the good guy in the front office, he definitely succeeded. And apparently had no compunction of calling Vance Joseph up to the to his office and saying, hey, look, this report's breaking across Denver right now. 
just so you know, you know, maybe here are, here's what the true elements of the story might be. Here's what's not true, you know, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, you're absolutely right on that. I think my gut tells me that if you're looking for, I mean, obviously Woody cites in his, in his article, as I said, five different sources, but you have to wonder if the ultimate source there is coming from Elway's office because, well, let's look at the whole who benefits thing. Why would John Elway want to push that in any way? I mean, you got to look at the timing of it. You know, as far as who benefits, to me, Zach, I can only think of two reasons why at this stage John Elway would want that story leaked as far as the timing where we're at in the season. One, he's trying to shuck some of the blame of this, the negative you know, backswell, whatever, of another losing season and just the enormous disappointment in the fan base with Vance Joseph and the feeling that, you know, I mean, a year ago, maybe one in 20 fans, you know, from a social media aspect would say something negative or blame Elway. Now it's probably about 50-50. If there's a, if you go through and look at any of the comments on like our Facebook articles or anything like that, our Facebook shares, and and it's a, you know, like a macro article about the state of the team, about half the people blame Elway now and about half the people blame Vance Joseph. So it would make sense to leak something like this to take some of the heat off of Elway in a sense. That could be perhaps a motivating factor. But the only other thing I could think of, Zach, number two, is he actually wants Mike Shanahan to be a viable option. And this is a way of kind of pushing it out there onto the market and forcing it into the limelight, the spotlight more like, where Joe Ellis cast in kind of a negative light now in the market, in the NFL world, is he might now have to kind of go against his own personal um, wishes or his own personal scores that he might have to settle with Shanahan and swallow his pride if it comes down to it to make the hire if that's what John Elway ends up wanting to push, you know, two, three weeks from now when they do the coaching search. I think if it's number two, he kind of screwed himself because they already reportedly said that Shanahan won't be a candidate if they do have a coaching search when, not if, Joseph is fired. So um, Ellis is not going to eat his words and go back on his words in that stance and say, okay, you can have him now. I'm going to give in to you. I'm going to give all my power away. I don't really know what the root cause is there. The only thing I can think of, and adding on to your point, maybe I'm overthinking it, is the fact that I think Elway, if he did leak this, is challenging Ellis because Elway knows that his position with the Broncos, he's a Denver legend. He's an iconic figure in that market, and his job security is rock solid. He knows he's pretty much unfireable, so he knows that he can float anything he wants out there with any sort of spin he wants, and he's not going to get any sort of ramifications for it. He's not going to get fired. He's not going to get demoted. He knows he has that power, and he knows that Ellis, even though he's technically above him, would not do anything to ruffle those feathers because he knows Elway's reputation in Denver. It's the only thing I can think of because mm-hmm. I think like just the way the story is worded and just the way it's shaped, it, it, it has to be tied to Elway in some capacity. Yeah, I, I agree. I tend to agree with you on that. That's what my my gut and intuition has been telling me since this thing broke is like, where did it come from and who benefits? You know, the only other idea was would be is from a who benefits perspective would be that Mike Shanahan's the one that's been pushing this because he's trying right. to advance his agenda, right? That could be too. Which would make a lot of sense. But I think probably if you were able to drill down and get the answer, absolutely, there's probably information coming from both camps because – Obviously, those were the two parties trying to make this thing happen. The one aspect of it that, to me, I don't know how much of that story makes a lot of sense is the whole Kirk Cousins scenario, because technically the timing of those conversations that Elway and Shanahan would have had to have had in terms of, you know, putting a deal together, getting it all worked out in time to for Elway to sleep on that decision to fire Vance Joseph or not. I mean, we're talking, what, late December you know, early right. days, what, day or two of January. I mean, that, that's how immediate the decision came to retain Vance Joseph for another year. And so at that point, Kirk Cousins is playing football for the Washington Redskins. We we knew how focused he was on getting paid a huge max contract and pushing the idea of getting the majority of it guaranteed. He wanted to set the new market for guaranteed money for a quarterback And as much as he might have a sentimental tie to Mike Shanahan, I have a hard time believing that he would countenance the idea of taking any kind of discount to go anywhere. 
That's actually the exact logic that went through my head when I read that. It's like even if Shanahan was rehired and they and he wanted Kirk Cousins, Cousins got what ninety guaranteed, fully guaranteed. That's a little less than three times more than Case Keenum got. The Broncos could not have afforded Kirk Cousins anyway. So even if Shanahan wanted him, um, whether he would have got him and outbid the Vikings or the Jets, that remains to be seen. So yeah, I'm with you. That part of the story, um, it kind of. Uh, it lost some of its its credibility a little bit to me, just a little bit. I, I don't think that yeah. he'd be so – he would tie his wagon to Kirk Cousins. He can work with Case Keenum too, Mike Shanahan, and he would have gotten more out of Keenum than his coaching staff did. Um, but, yeah, even if they wanted him, his price tag was just way too high. See, and that's the thing is you brought up the, the reports from – the likes of Mike Kliss, who are saying that Mike Shanahan will no, will not be considered as a, a candidate in the coming head coaching search. And that has been reported. We've even re- reported it from our website that, look, here's what, what the, you know, the main guys in the know are saying. I don't necessarily think that's the case. I'm, I think that I wouldn't be surprised if Mike Shanahan somehow through this, the momentum of this piece, I mean, if there's, the truth is there, obviously, that Elway wanted to make this happen a year ago. And if, it, if he wanted it a year ago, why wouldn't he want it again now? I mean, he would maybe even want it more now. Obviously, he would still have that obstacle with Ellis. But let's just say for the sake of conversation, I wrote an article uh, after we the news broke and we had some time to digest it. You know, would it make football sense for the Denver Broncos to bring Mike Shanahan back as the head coach? And basically, the conclu- well, before I get to my conclusion, let me put it to you this way, Zach. Under what circumstances in your mind – if it does make sense to you at all for Mike Shanahan to come back, okay, under what circumstances would it make sense for the Denver Broncos to try and rekindle history, rekindle that old spark, rekindle the Shanahan Elway chemistry, and bring him back as head coach? I don't ever think you can set the bar that high and hope to, you know, have that sort of chemistry uh, all these years removed. I mean, the game has kind of passed him by a little bit, and it reminds me of what John Gruden dealt with and all the coaching rumors he faced the last couple of years before he finally decided to come back. Oh, he, you know, he, his offense wouldn't work in today's NFL. It's, it's a different kind of defense. I happen to think it would be a good hire. I happen to think he would get more out of this Broncos offense, which is not saying a lot. Um, but in order for it to thrive, he could not have personnel control. And that wouldn't happen with Elway here anyway. So as right. long as he doesn't have total control, I think it'd be a good hire. I think obviously it'd be a big upgrade on Vance Joseph. Um, but I do happen to think that, I mean, he's forgotten more offensive football than most of us will ever know. So he still has it in him. And Kyle Shanahan admitted in an, inter- in an interview before the Broncos game a couple weeks ago that his father yes. still watches football religiously every single day. Well, not just so watches football, watches film in a quote-unquote darkened room. Right, right. He's still obsessed with the game, crazy about the game. So as long as he has that in him, um, I'd be all for it, actually. Here's the thing, and I agree with you that I think it would be a good hire. I'm going I'm, – I mean – I didn't exactly push this as a, a narrative at the end of that gut reaction article I wrote, but I really do. The more I've I've ruminated on it, the more I like the idea. However, I would want the Broncos to go through a coaching search to make sure he's he's a superior choice to anyone else out there. But get Agreed. back to what I said, the conditions, I agree with you on the personnel thing, and I don't think that would be an issue because Everyone, most of the latest reports of Shanahan when he has pursued coaching opportunities at this point in his career, he doesn't want a job that has personnel responsibilities along with it or power. He just wants to coach. So that's good. And I think that that dynamic could work because John Elway probably views a lot of the way he he uh, analyzes personnel in the same way that Shanahan does, to be honest with you, because they were cut from the same cloth in a lot of ways. But here's where I would diverge and say, the one place if you were to hire Mike Shanahan as head coach that you got to give him almost absolute control personnel wise is you you would have to let him choose the next quarterback or at least have you know a really strong say or approval on who the next quarterback is because the Denver Broncos are going to advance no further i mean Coaching could have made the difference in maybe two or three more wins this year. But even if the Broncos were to win a wild card and get into the playoffs in 2018 as a sixth seed, they're not going anywhere. They're not winning a world championship. They're going to get bounced from the playoffs. So coaching could have gotten a couple, two or three extra wins this year, but it's not going to get them over the hump until they have the quarterback. they got to find a quarterback. And so whoever that next coach is, and if it were to be Mike Shanahan, Zach, I think especially him being a mastermind and a guy who – 
knows how to identify which quarterbacks can operate his system at a high level, you would have to let him have a really strong say at minimum on the next quarterback drafted. Like if the Broncos end up trying to sell out and move up in the draft to get a guy this coming draft, or if they go after a trade for somebody, or if they, you know, look at spending more money on another quarterback, whatever that option might be, you would have to let and allow Mike Shanahan to step in and be a big part of that decision. I don't even think that's a question or a concern. I mean, if they were to negotiate, that'd be one of the chief negotiating points is, what about the quarterback? I would not saddle Shanahan with Case Keenum if he doesn't think Keenum is the right man for his system. I would give him the option. Absolutely, I agree with you. Um, More likely, though, given their financial constraints, they're going to have to be rolling out Keenum next year. They might have a young player under him, but he'll probably start. If Shanahan thinks, and if he's hired, if he's the one that can turn him around and get the most out of him, sure. But I would not force Shanahan to use Case Keenum because it would be probably an ill-suited fit. So I agree with you there for sure. Well, and one thing to keep in mind is, let's not forget, you go back in time to 2012 when Case Keenum was declaring for the NFL draft. Mike Shanahan had absolute and total control over Redskins personnel. He could have drafted him, but he didn't. I mean, sure. granted, he had two really good court, young quarterbacks already on the roster in RG3 and Kirk Cousins, but he didn't draft Case Keenum, nor did he offer him a – well, we don't know that he didn't offer him a contract to sign as a college free agent, but Kubiak did, and they you know, they run basically the, the bones of the same system, Kubiak and Shanahan. So – at, at minimum, you would assume that Shanahan could probably make it work or get more out of Case Keenum than Bill Musgrave was able to this year. But I certainly don't think that Keenum would be, in Shanahan's eyes, I doubt he would view him as the ideal candidate. And one thing to keep in mind is that if you go back to that 2012 draft where the Redskins moved up to navigate to number two, that decision to draft Robert Griffin the third was ownership driven. The guy that was more the Shanahan pick in that particular draft was Kirk Cousins. So all of that, that was part of the blowback, part of the drama and the power struggle that took place in Washington over the ensuing two seasons was between Shanahan and RG3 because Shanahan kind of resisted it from the get-go. It wasn't really his guy. Cousins was his guy. And if you go back to 2013 at the end of that Redskins season when, you know, RG3 had had surgery in the offseason after they'd gone to the playoffs in his rookie year. He went to the Pro Bowl and all this stuff, but he had surgery to uh, fix his knee that he totally thrashed against the Seahawks in the playoffs and missed all of the preseason. So Shanahan was kind of slow rolling him, and then he even wanted to slow roll him even more per reports, but because Griffin was adamant to come back and play, let him play. And then finally at the end of the year, they're basically out of the playoffs, Shanahan sits Griffin down because he's injured. That was his excuse to ownership. Look, I don't want him to get any further hurt than he already is. Let's protect our investment. But he wanted to get Kirk Cousins on the field for those final three games, and he did. And that was ultimately uh, probably his the death knell in his career is with the Washington Redskins. That's a great point, and that just shows what happens when you saddle a coach with not his quarterback choice. And, you know, maybe Case Keenum is or isn't his guy. One player who I'd like to see in Shanahan's offense if he comes back, Chad Kelly. I would just love to see what he can do with him. It's not going to happen, but the physical talent is there. I think he would thrive in that system. I don't know. I mean, you don't have a young quarterback on the roster. It's a shame I won't see it, but I'd love to see what Kelly can do in a Shanahan offense. Now, tonight we are very limited on time, so let's really quick segue to the Mile High Mailbag and get some of our listeners. we got a ton of questions and reactions from the mailbag because each and every week, Zach and I pride ourselves on being your football priest to offer that absolution and the answers to your Burning Broncos questions, and there are a ton of them today, so let me just run through some of these here. Let's start here with Dion Hicks. Let's say, this is Dion, let's say Shanahan comes back as head coach and hires Gary Kubiak as his offensive coordinator. Who do you think would be a good fit at defensive coordinator? Zach, do you have anyone off, off the top of your head you could think of? No, not on the top of my head. I'd have to go through you know, past connections to Shanahan and you know all that. I, I don't really have anyone. The only thing I'll say is that it, it, anyone's better than Joe Woods at this point. So I don't have any uh, you know, definite candidates. I will say that Jim Schwartz, if he gets fired... If he doesn't get a head coaching job, that'd be a pretty good hire. Yeah, and his contract, from what I understand, Schwartz, expires at the end of this season. Oh, okay, there so you go, that, then. 
that's definitely uh, something to keep in mind. You might even look at Vance Joseph, keep him around as a defensive coordinator, even though that would never happen. But Delete um, your account. Yeah, absolutely. But we'd have to look at uh, who's going to be available in January on the coaching level to kind of connect those dots for you, Dion. So let's go to Paul here. First off, happy holidays. As to you as well, Paul. Two questions. If Harbaugh isn't an option, John, who would your next top choice be? Should we bolster the roster in 2019 at cornerback and off-ball linebacker and go all in on a quarterback in 2020 versus 2019. It's a two-year build, uh, rebuild anyways, or will we panic for a QB and leave the roster with lots of holes? So what he's saying is, are we going to pri- prioritize roster holes in 2019 because it's not a strong quarterback class, or are we going to panic and go for a QB despite the fact that it's not a strong class? But what about Harbaugh? Harbaugh, if he doesn't... Uh, if he doesn't come to Denver. Option, who's, your, who's your top head coach option uh, if Harbaugh's off the table? Okay, so I think – and I wanted to say this earlier, so I'm glad I get to say it now. If the Broncos go for a retread coach, which I think that's what Elway's leaning toward, it's either going to be Harbaugh, Shanahan, or Mike McCarthy. And of those three, uh, give me Jim John Harbaugh and give me um, Mike Shanahan. I do not want Mike McCarthy. So if they go for a veteran retread, I like Harbaugh, I like Shanahan, don't want McCarthy. That's my answer to that. Yeah, I veteran retread. There's also some other options to keep in mind. Jim Schwartz is one of them, who we've already mentioned. I my understanding is, and Mile High Huddle VIPs know this, that the Broncos do like the idea of Jim Schwartz, even though he's not an offensive guy, he's a defensive guy. So just keep that in mind. Also, don't forget about Chuck Pagano, who's from Denver, who's also a retread mm. that could make uh, be attractive to a guy like John Elway at this point, looking for a capable person, capable coach with experience, but. If it's not a retread, my number one guy at the top of the list remains Dave Tobe. It's a it's a great choice. I mean, he's a well respected name around the NFL, and you know they they interviewed him already. So yeah, I, I was high on John D. Filippo, but he got fired, and I kind of ruined his stock. I still like coordinators around the NFL. Um, Jim Bob Cooter, Matt Lafleur. I like some college coaches. I would love Lincoln Riley. I don't think they'll, they'll go to that well just yet. Uh, David Shaw. Um, I, regardless, though, I want an offensive guy. If they don't get a, a veteran retread, I want a guy with an offensive proven background, even if it's and I'm dare I say. Josh McDaniels again. Hmm. Here's one from Paul, just more of a reaction. He says, look, I don't want to revisit the Shanahan ship. It's not the late 90s anymore. Now, that's a common theme for quite a few people. It's probably, I don't know, 60, 40 of, as far as the feedback I'm seeing on social media and comments of people, fans being for it. But about 40%, including Paul, that are like, look, that ship sailed. He was fired for a reason, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, here's one from Levi. First thing, greetings from Brazil. Greetings, Levi. Thanks for listening. I listen to the podcast every week. My question is, with all these problems involving the Broncos franchise, you do not think some candidates would refuse an offer from the Broncos. So do you think, Zach, with everything that is besetting the Broncos right now with the lawsuits, Bill Bowen and and at least one of Pat Bowen's daughters being kind of involved in that, suing the franchise, three consecutive crappy seasons, and then this recent apparent power struggle of sorts between Elway and Ellis. Are there coach candidates out there, viable ones, who you think might kind of look at other options before the Denver Broncos now? Well, you know, money talks. So if they offer a guy $4 million a year and he wants money, he'll probably take it. But I tweeted this the other day, and I think it's true. They have no day-to-day owner, no long-term quarterback, no stadium sponsor, and now a GM feuding with his team president. You wonder how attractive this this opening would really be. So, yeah, I would think it would sway some of the more elite names. Like Jim Harbaugh would never come to Denver and take on this, this reclamation project. He would not do it. They can get a, a lesser guy, but they were not get an elite guy with this current situation. They have no building bu- blocks in place where you need them to be. A quarterback with ownership, with a steady GM and what he, his philosophy, what he wants to do, a coaching staff on the way out, a frustrated fan base. Yeah. No major name is going to want to step in here and take on this mess. So, yeah, I think it does hurt them. And that's one of the reasons why I think it makes some sense to turn to a guy like Mike Shanahan who could, you know, he's he's old guard. He's one of the family. He's, you know, ring of fame. He's got a Hall of Fame resume, to be honest with you. So 
that's we'll get more into that here in just a little bit. Here's one from Dylan West. In your guys' opinions, what are the long-term ramifications for the storm that popped up this week with Woody Page in terms of the organization and how badly does this tarnish the organization in terms of respect and ultimately Pat Boland's legacy? And then he follows that up with, well, answer that first. What do you think might be the long-term ramifications with all this Shanahan story popping up this week on the organization in your mind? Uh, long term, the worst case scenario is if they don't get the guy they want because of all these different things popping up. That's the worst thing long term I can think of. Personally, I don't think it will be have any long term effects. If they got get the guy they want, if they hire the next Sean McVay, then we'll even forget this even existed. Winning cures all in the NFL, and so does hiring the right guy to lead the charge. So. I don't think it's going to impact them negatively too far long down the road, but in the next coming months when they go on their coaching search, it's going to be coming to the front of the fray. Here's the problem. The worst case scenario is that it finally crosses the scrutiny and attention of Commissioner Roger Goodell, who forces the hand of the Pat Bowlen Trust to either sell the club or pass it on to an heir of Pat Bowlen's. That would, to me, be the worst case scenario for the Broncos organization, which still wouldn't reflect well on Pat Bowlen having to force the NFL to step in and strong arm what his succession end game plan ultimately was before he lost all of his faculties. But here's one thing I'll say too, is you look at your Sean McVay's, you look at your Matt Nagy's, these young and coaches, even look at Anthony Lynn, guys who were first time head coaches that had immediate success or relative success with their clubs. It's, it's important to get the right coach, okay? That's obviously a big part of the equation. The Broncos missed on that big time with Vance Joseph. But each one of those corresponds to already having a quarterback or a viable yep. young quarterback to build around, which the Broncos do not have. Now, here comes one from Dylan West. Well, this is the second part to Dylan's question. Also, does all of this, along with Vance Joseph and the turbulence at head coach, affect how players view Denver as a free agent Destination, And this ties back in, I think, Zach, to the quarterback. If you don't have a quarterback, good luck recruiting the high end. Well, you're, you're still going to be able to get the, the top guys that are just looking for max money, like maybe a Landon Collins out there, who the Broncos apparently have some interest in. You're still going to be able to get those guys who are just going to go to the team that can pay him the most. And the Broncos are going to have to pay some people next year, to be honest with you. But those team discounts like DeMarcus Ware took to come here and play in 2014 – he took that discount because he knew his team was in, the, the Broncos were in a Super Bowl window because of the quarterback. Right, Peyton Manning's not walking through that door, and, and no one's going to come, um, you know, take less money or pass up an opportunity to play with Case Keenum. So yeah, I agree with you. Uh, free agents will still view Denver as a as a one B choice or a two B choice, and not the premier choice because they don't have a quarterback in place. And for right now, they have no direction, no leadership, no coach, and uh, no owner. So it's not an attractive uh, team right now. Here's one from Jedi Joshua fifty eight. I'd be hard-pressed to get on board with Shanny coming back. He'd need to change with the time, scheme-wise, and have no personnel decisions. A say, but not the be-all, end-all. I am of the mind to lure a college coach, like the Huskies or the Cyclones coach. Thoughts? I understand, Joshua, the, the, you know, the desire to go after a young college coach, like Zach brought up earlier, going after a Lincoln Riley or even Matt Campbell from Iowa State or well, some of these guys in college that have some juice that are kind of flirting with the idea of going to the pros but haven't quite made the jump. I get that. But from a reality perspective, John Elway is going to go for a more proven NFL coach. I, I just don't see them deviating from that in any way. And even if it's a guy like Dave Tobe, who's not been a head coach in the past, it's someone that is relatively proven at the NFL level. Yeah, it's also tough to lure a, a coach away from college because they make such good money. They get to recruit. They have more power, more control. They're more revered. So it, it's always tough getting them to flip to the NFL. And I don't see it happening. I'm with you, Chad. I think they go for a, a veteran coach. And I will say this. They don't. They just need a coach who will stay out of the way, who won't negatively impact games, who just has some shred of integrity and competency, and they can do his job. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be complicated. They just have to be an upgrade on Vance Joseph, and they can win football games. No matter who the head coaching hire is, they're gonna have not they're not gonna have it easy because they don't have a viable quarterback. But you significantly make it even harder on like a young college coach trying to make the pro jump when you saddle him with a first time job in the NFL and he doesn't have a quarterback. So right. that's another reason why it's just not the right time for the Broncos to go 
to the unproven realm of the college ranks. Now, here comes one from Steve Holton on Twitter, who says, in your opinions, would the Broncos do better to bring back Mike Shanahan, an option that I would love to see, says Steve, or would someone else be a better choice? I think we've pretty much answered that one for you, Steve, that we both like the idea, but I think we're both pretty much in agreement that we'd want the Broncos to undergo a comprehensive head coaching search, a la what Joe Ellis was apparently really saying to John Elway, and if Mike Shanahan ended up being the best option after all things considered, then so be it. It's pretty simple. I would take any candidate over Vance Joseph right now, but of the veteran retreads, I would take Shanahan or Jim uh, John Harbaugh. I just don't want Mike McCart- uh, McCarthy. So, uh, yeah, I, I just think, again, they go in that direction. They're not going to go for a first-timer. They're not going to go for a rookie. They're going to go for a guy who has some sort of proven background, and it could be a guy who's already been an NFL head coach at this level. So um, if it's Shanahan, great. Is anyone but Vance Joseph, anyone but Mike McCarthy. We have a ton and ton of questions and comments here. We're not going to be able to get to them all because we're running out of time. In fact, we're already out of time, but we'll grab one or two more here. From Nathaniel Belt on Twitter, he says, I have the feeling that they will hire a veteran coach and will likely not be a very sexy hire. Denver needs a steady hand to buffer the team from the front office ownership chaos. Also, does it all come down to coaching. I think we've addressed that as well, Zach, <laughs> that coaching is important. The next guy is crucial, making the right decision, but you need a quarterback too. Here's one from Digital in Bacon. Happy holidays to you as well. With all the extra garbage going on in Dove Valley, Zach, do you think Denver will be a highly sought after coaching gig? It seems like Denver usually has its pick of coaches first. We've kind of addressed that one as well. Um, you know, Denver's star has, has dimmed a little bit, and one of the reasons why, it's not just because they've been losing. I mean, every coach, any coach worth his salt wants a head coaching job just for the money's sake, most of them anyway, the vast majority of them do. But for those who are actually in the running and highly sought after and coveted, they're going to go to the most favorable place that's going to give them the best chance to win. Right now, that's not Denver. Cleveland is where you want to go if you're a head coach right now. So uh, here's one from Christy. I don't know if Shanahan is the answer. Now, knowing that he could have been in the last season but was denied by Ellis, who else would be potentially vetoed by Ellis if he is the guy making the final calls? Zach, and this is a good question. Who do you think his choice would be? Who's in and who's out in the mind of Joe Ellis if you could get inside between his ears right now? Of this current coaching staff? Yeah, well, no. Of this current crop of coaches that's going to be available for the Broncos to hire oh, his on the coach carousel. Yeah, I, I would I would happen to think that after seeing the Vance Joseph mistake that he'd want also a veteran guy or at least a proven guy, uh, whether it's a guy who carries the cachet of a, a Shanahan or a Harbaugh remains to be seen. But I, I still think that Elway and Ellis are aligned in that sense that they want a veteran coach, not a rookie coach. It's one of the reasons why I still think there's a little something to be played out still in this whole Shanahan back to the Broncos story. So I think there's a reason why this thing broke at the time in which it did, okay? And I think we would be um, we'd be blind to not recognize that there's a reason why it's coming out now two weeks before Vance Joseph is poised to be, you know, what can't by the Denver Broncos. So mm-hmm. don't sleep on the idea, Broncos country, of Mike Shanahan ending up back in Denver and, you know, if he wants to coach, you, I think, Zach, you did a good job of laying this out that, you know, look, on one hand, you have to recognize that old coaches who had a lot of success with the team in, in their first uh, tenure, then retreads like you can go back to Joe Gibbs with the Washington Redskins, Art Shell with the Oakland Raiders. You've seen what's happening with Gruden now, his second go around with the <clears throat> Oakland Raiders. It doesn't typically spell a lot of success. We haven't seen it really pan out in a big way for a team quite yet. But the flip side to that coin is the Broncos need stability. They need an offensive mastermind. <clears throat> and as far as Mike Shanahan's concerned, I'm not too worried about him being one of the, like in the case of Gruden where the game seems to kind of have passed him by. With Mike Shanahan, I really am not, I wouldn't be as worried about that because A, he's got a hard line into his son, Kyle Shanahan. I guarantee you, I guarantee you it might not be literally putting game plans together with his dad, but I would bet money that that Kyle Shanahan on a weekly basis talks to his dad about certain concepts and ideas and play calls oh, yeah. and this and that. And so what I'm getting at is you can believe that Mike Shanahan is very well dialed in 
to the cutting edge of what's predominating the NFL right now with the way kind of some of these college schemes are coming to the NFL, uh, the RPOs and read options. And there's a way to creatively weave that into Mike Shanahan's West Coast um, zone blocking scheme in the same way that we've seen Kyle Shanahan do it when he's had a competent quarterback. And, you know, he had RG3, and RG3 was running RPOs before RPOs were a thing, so he has some basic knowledge of it, and he's still watching film, and he's still breaking it down. He's still very close to the NFL world, and like you said, great point, Kyle and him probably talk a lot about the NFL. He's clued in a lot. Um, you got me thinking, though, how Ellis wants to go. I'm going to put this out there. You said don't be surprised if Shanahan comes back. Don't be surprised. The Broncos finish 8-8, eight and eight, and I don't want this to happen if Vance comes back for a third year. It's still a possibility. There's no guarantee he's going to be fired. I happen to think he will. The signs are, are pointing to that. But maybe he vetoed it because he wants Joseph. It's a conspiracy theory. I know it's probably way far off. But you never really know. So yeah. um, if they finish 8-8, eight eight, though, do not be surprised if Elway and Ellis shock everyone and bring it back for a third year. And if that happens, watch the Denver Broncos season ticket purchase rate <laughs> finally. This, this you know, these consecutive sellouts going back three decades. Watch that finally trail out because – you would have literally the least enthusiastic fan base in the entire NFL going into 2019. So, uh, but I'm with you. You know, you can't sleep on any possibility, but all the signs and everyone we're talking to, and every, even the most plugged in guys publicly, you know, the beat writers, uh, the insider guys, they're saying basically, you know, they're hinting around that there's going to be a coaching change. And on one hand, I'm telling you, just don't sleep on the idea of Mike Shanahan. On the other, I think what we're both telling you is that John Elway and probably Joe Ellis, too, to get back to Christie's question, I think they're going to be drawn to a stable, proven coach. And, you know, if they end up not going with a retread of some sort, I think they're going to go with a coordinator who has established years upon years of consistent production and a resume that goes back years like a Dave Tobe. It's not going to be a one-year wonder <clears throat> position coach, one year removed from, you know, coaching a, an individual position. I will say this, though. Last year at this time, there were rumblings that Gruden was finally going to come out of the booth and come back to the NFL. Yeah. A couple weeks later, he was hired by the Raiders. So where there's smoke, there's fire in the NFL. <laughs> That's right. And if Shanahan, these rumors are popping up, maybe we'll happen to see what happens in a couple weeks if Joseph gets fired and you never really know. Can you just believe it, though? Shanahan could be rehired by the mm. Broncos. I mean, it's just crazy to think about. It really is. It really is. But And even it's crazy at this point to think that in so many ways, the idea of rehiring Mike Shanahan sounds like a life lifeline to this organization right now right you know i mean that's just where we're at but you know if you look at it from the upside and in positive lens the broncos under john elway have had a lot of success with the idea of getting the band back together and i mean everything gary kubiak knows he learned from mike shanahan and vice versa as far as john elway so we'll see how this thing shakes out but uh we're glad that we got an opportunity to come to you with this impromptu episode. You won't hear from us again till probably the day after Christmas because this next game, of course, is very inconveniently on Christmas Eve, which makes life extremely hard on guys like Zach. Thanks, and I. NFL. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, the players got it bad themselves, but those of us who have to cover the team and have uh, deadlines and who have, um, you know, expectations of our masters. It's uh, it's going to make it hard to really sit back and enjoy Christmas Eve and Christmas. So we'll plan on coming back to you to react to whatever happens in week 16 on Wednesday, the day after Christmas. So in the meantime, happy holidays to all of you. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays, guys. And uh, we'll talk to you guys soon. Make sure, obviously, we haven't even touched on this today, but make sure you're following the show on Twitter. Looks like a lot more of you have come around on that, which is good. You're getting in on the Mile High Mailbag. At Huddle Up Pod, find Zach on Twitter at Kelberman247. You can find me at Chad and Jensen. And in the meantime, if you haven't done it, take some time. Go leave a creative review and rate the show. Give us a five star rating on iTunes, especially, and Stitcher as well. And uh, other than that, you guys keep your chin up. It's bad right now, but there's only one way for this organization to go, and that's up. And Zach and I are looking forward to breaking down all the new changes and the improvements this team can make in 2019. So keep your chin up, and uh, we'll come back to you here soon. And in the meantime, have a merry, merry Christmas. You've been listening to the Huddle Up! Podcast. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com to keep the conversation going.